Someone offered you an investment that could deliver 200% interest with virtually no risk. With a deal that lucrative, who could resist? But beware, because this kind of deal is known as a prime bank scheme, and these schemes are really scams. What is, is happening here is securities are being offered, and these prime banks are supposedly guaranteeing or backing payment of the securities. So it's supposed to be very high yield and very low risk. Denise Voigt Crawford works for the Texas State Securities Board, a law enforcement agency that investigates security scams. Last year, 15 prime bank schemes claimed $100 million from unsuspecting victims. In the scam, so-called prime banks, supposedly the world's top banks, allegedly sell financial instruments such as corporate IOUs to the investors at reduced rates. These, in turn, can then be sold for big profits. Trouble is, there are no real banks or profits involved. For example, a, a, an investor is told that a trader is able to get a $10 million note by only paying $8 million. Then the trader is ostensibly going to resell that note to, say, a pension fund for the face value of $10 million. That's a $2 million profit. That's how the scam artist assures the investor that the investor will receive an outrageously high return. The hook with prime bank schemes is that it's an opportunity to make a lot of money in a relatively short period of time with little or no risk. But as we know, it's a complete fraud. Sandra Harris is an associate regional director for the Securities and Exchange Commission. She says that prime bank schemers use a variety of methods to locate unsuspecting investors, and they make themselves seem legitimate by using actual banking terminology and convincing brochures. A lot of times they will purchase phone lists. Sometimes it might be a phone list of a retirement community and they will just go down the list and engage in what is called cold calling. Pick up the phone, describe the investment, often using very high pressure sales tactics to try to persuade, persuade someone to invest. Other times there will be meetings or seminars on investing, at which time they will pitch the investment. Technology has also played a part in the growth of prime bank schemes, says Sonia Barbera, a public information officer for the American Bankers Association. We have seen this, this fraud on the rise in recent years. It seems to have been on the rise with the advent of the Internet and people being able to send masses of emails around the world, literally. So certainly more and more people have been targeted. Unlike cold calling, which requires that you call individuals or conduct a mass mailing or hold a seminar, you put up a website and you have a vast number of potential investors available. To avoid falling prey to a prime bank scheme, don't rush into any investment decision. If a bank's name is connected to an investment, call them to verify their involvement and always check out the investment opportunity itself. Investments are supposed to be registered with state securities regulators before they're offered and sold in a given jurisdiction. So you can call and find out if the particular investment has been registered. And if you find out that it has not been, that should be another big red flag. Also, be warned that a prime bank scheme by any other name is still a prime bank scheme. Sometimes it might be called a trading program or sometimes a role program. What some of the promoters have tried to do recently is to avoid using the term prime bank thinking that by doing that they will deceive investors into believing that this is not a prime bank investment and that they will also deceive the regulators. Anything that offers an unrealistic rate of return that includes documents that offer include very, very confusing language that are meant to embarrass you and to confuse you, those are telltale signs that you are being targeted for an investment fraud. If you've already been the victim of a prime bank scheme, there's help. Start by contacting the SEC or your local state securities regulator. It's very unlikely that you're going to get your money back. But you should always complain to your state securities regulator because uh, it could be one of those rare instances where we're able to recover your money. Even if 
or not, it's very important to contact us to help keep other people from being scammed. One of the, the first ways we get information about a scam is through an investor who has their canceled check. That way we're able to identify a bank account, which is critical because it helps us determine how, many, how much money has been raised, how many investors are involved, how much money is still left, and where the money is located. Regardless of how convincing these bank schemes may seem, it's up to you to resist their lure. These investments are not legitimate in any way, shape, or form. So no matter what someone tells you to try to persuade you to invest, always remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. For more on prime bank schemes, we'll give you the address for the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission right after these important messages. We all love trying new restaurants, but how do you tell the good from the bad before you sit down and have an ugly experience? We did a little prep work for you. That's what we do. Check this out. How can I find quality restaurants when I'm traveling? To sample the local cuisine, travel and food writer Erica Lenkert says the best thing to do is to hit the street. When I'm visiting a place I've never been before and I don't know a lot about restaurants, I will start asking people. Really great people to ask are concierge. They tend to have a lot of information. I've stopped in barber parlors and ask them what's happening. The local paper usually has excellent reviews that will give you more accurate information than some other sources. I would, would happily stop people on the street and ask them where's a good place to eat. And if you ask three or four people and they all say the same thing, then it's probable that it's a pretty decent choice. How can I judge a restaurant's culinary skill? A well-prepared Caesar salad is curiously difficult to find. So if a restaurant serves a really good Caesar salad, I, I have a tendency to think they're probably going to be better at a lot of things. Creme brulee is another one that people, for some reason, have a problem with the consistency, and that's one that I can easily judge a restaurant by. I think that you know, seafood is a really good way to uh, pay attention to how well a restaurant prepares food also because it's really easy to overcook and once that happens it pretty much ruins it. How should I tip? People nowadays seem to tip because they feel like they have to and like they're cheap if they don't and m in my mind your tip is your strongest message to your server. If they did a brilliant job tip them well. I almost always tip 20% when the service is good. If I have bad service, I will leave 10% happily and perhaps less if it was really horrible because it's the only way for you to let this person know you can't treat people like that. What about the restaurants that get bad reviews? Don't necessarily follow critics' advice. And one of the things that I find so fascinating is that people will say a restaurant is good just because everybody else says it's good. If you like the little corner restaurant that nobody's paying attention to, like it and support it. Any more questions? Post them on our website at LifetimeTV.com. And now for that little hair quiz. Let's go. I got New Attitudes down as my favorite show. Lifetime is my favorite channel. And New York is my favorite city. Okay, let me add this up. Carry to three. That's two. That's eight billion points. Apparently, I should have a long blonde hair like Gwyneth Paltrow. All right, well, you know, that's it for that test. Thanks a lot for coming around. We'll see you next time.